Marios asks, have you heard about uh, Vitalik's new proposal to impose gas fees on wallet transactions to fund developers? What is this about? Strictly speaking, this is a bit off topic, but I'll answer it quickly. There is a proposal in the Ethereum community that was started by Vitalik to have as a common practice, not as a rule of the protocol, not as a rule imposed by consensus, but simply as a common practice, have every wallet impose a slight fee on every transaction, a voluntary fee, um, that funds developers uh, in the protocol, or at least funds wallet development. Now, this is something that also happens in Bitcoin. There are wallets where, when you make a transaction, um, you have the option to also make a donation or add a small fee that goes to wallet developers. Usually, that's done with a payment channel. Uh, sometimes it's done uh, with a straight Bitcoin transaction. In Lightning wallets, it's done again with a payment channel. This isn't different in in any way. Uh, what Vitalik proposed, however, was to make this part of the best practices so that the development of wallet software is better funded. Now, this is a problem in many blockchains. Wallets represent the cutting edge, the front end of user interface development, and a feature that is designed into the protocol or the consensus layer, for example, doesn't really become active until a wallet can use it and exposes that to users in a way that's intuitive. So even though something may be available, let's take an example. Um, in Bitcoin, for example, uh, native SegWit addresses that start with BC1. Have you seen one of those? You probably haven't. Why? Because probably about 80% of wallets don't yet implement them. Only a few wallets implement them at the moment. So even though that feature has existed now for more than six months in the base protocol, its implementation in wallets is still lagging. This is a problem across all blockchains, and the problem is that wallets are not very well funded. Most wallets are available for free, um, and they have to make money by advertising, by selling other services and things like that. So that's Vitalik's proposal. Better funded wallets, better developed wallets through a mechanism of uh, voluntary fees that are added to transactions. Stephen asks, should we consider the number of dApps on a blockchain, the number of commits on the code, the blockchain activity and the peer-to-peer -peer account uh, numbers of cryptos as valid performance indicators? Uh, Stephen, it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Performance indicators tell you something about the blockchain, but they also tell you a lot about the person who chose the performance indicators. If I look at which performance indicators you're interested in, I will be able to tell what's important to you in terms of a blockchain. Is it important as an investment? Is it something where you're looking for future increases in value? Are you looking at um, performance metrics that tell you whether it is sufficiently decentralized or um, whether it is actively developed, showing a lot of innovation in the community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, it depends if you're a trader, if you're a developer, if you're interested in the technology, if you're interested in it as an investment or as part of your portfolio, you're going to choose different metrics. And so it depends really on what you consider good performance. What is the best blockchain, which depends on what you're trying to do with it. Um, I've talked about this in the past, which is that we all have different metrics for success. To me, for example, the blockchain that has the most money invested into it isn't necessarily the most interesting blockchain. If that blockchain is centralized and run by a bank, of course it has lots of money invested into it. That's what banks have, lots of money. That doesn't make it the blockchain that delivers the most freedom, or the most political empowerment, or the most uh, economic inclusion to people. Um, it does not develop the most innovation. And, and so those metrics are more important to me than other metrics. In general, however, it's difficult in many cases to measure these things accurately. Like, what does it mean to look at the number of commits? Um, how do you value code uh, based on metrics of commits? Uh, what if uh, a lot of these commits are changing the spelling of words and comments? Or 
do you count lines? What if it's written in a more expressive language where you need fewer lines? Does that mean it's a less valid project? Probably the opposite. Um, you know, I, I, if you write uh, your project in assembly, then your commits will have a lot of line changes, but that doesn't make it any better. It just means that the language you're using um, is more verbose and less expressive. So, you know, it's, it's really difficult to pick any kind of metric. And in fact, in this industry, we see a lot of people trying to attach themselves to certain metrics or argue certain metrics. And really, that reveals their biases rather than any useful information about which blockchain is working. In the day, what really matters is which of these systems solves a problem for you better than any of the other systems that you've used um, as a user, as a developer, as someone who's making dApps, perhaps, or someone who's just using it to do something, maybe cross-border transactions, micropayments, whatever. All of those things will determine which blockchain is good for you, so your criteria are different from everybody else's. Um, again, part of that is not seeing this as an investment zero-sum game, where one system wins and another system loses. Mm -hmm.